Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Family Medicine Residency Showcase tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Scott Allen. I'm the CEO for the Family Medicine Education Consortium. And tonight we are going to be hearing about fellowship and job opportunities in family medicine, and also hearing about the UPMC Shadyside Family Medicine Residency. So just for a minute or two, if for those who don't know who the FMEC is, I'd like to give you a little background. Uh, we are a catalyst convener and incubator. And what I like to say is we have three primary missions. One is to help medical students find their way into family medicine uh, and learn about family medicine. Another is to help family medicine residents as they're in training to do scholarly work, do presentations, connect with each other and learn from each other. And lastly, to help the faculty in those family medicine training programs to do the same, to come to our meetings, to meet each other, to help figure out how to teach better, meet ACGME guidelines, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we are in the Northeast US. We cover 14 states in the District of Columbia. That covers about 60 medical schools and over 200 family medicine residency training programs. Uh, we do an annual meeting each fall. We bring about 300 medical students on scholarship to learn about family medicine and have about 700 more people, faculty and residents who come and present and meet exhibitors and all that. Uh, we also do some awards. We have some learning collaboratives that are working outside of our meeting to improve care and teaching. And we have lots of ways you can get involved. So hopefully some of you are coming to our meeting in about a month, it's October 3rd, I'm sorry, two weeks. It was a month a few weeks ago, um, October 13th or 15th in Providence. And if you're not coming to that one, please put in your calendars to come to our 2024 meeting, which is September 19th through the 21st in Philadelphia, right downtown. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Weaver Agostoni from UPMC Shadyside. Excellent, thanks. So we are indeed going to talk about fellowship and job opportunities, but before we get started with that, we have a very small, nice group. If you're willing, I would prefer we start with going around, you telling me your name, uh, what year you are in school, where you go, um, and if you have any particular questions in this realm, and then I'll sort of get through my PowerPoint stuff, which is very short. Um, we'll hit the highlights, and then we can just chat about whatever you would like to hear about um, in this realm. Um, but let's just go around, and if you can't join in because your microphone doesn't work or whatever, that's totally fine. You can also put stuff in the chat if you'd like to share that way. Um, I will attempt to pronounce a name and we'll just go around that way. And um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce it, please correct it when I say it. So let's start. I have Monib first up in the upper right. Who's walking. I probably picked at the worst possible moment. Hi guys. So uh, yeah, my name is uh, Monib and I'm a uh, graduated from medical school earlier this year. I'm currently working as an assistant physician at the Columbia Urgent Care. Uh, I'm coming from the University of Iowa, Carver College of Medicine, as well as AUIS, and I'm interested in full spectrum care, holistic medicine, lifestyle medicine, and also sports medicine, too. Okay, great. All right, we will touch on all those things, so we'll, we'll definitely chat about some of that. Um, next on my screen, I see, is it Neola? Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Neola. I'm a physician from India. I'm also applying for a family medicine residency for this March. And um, I want to pursue family medicine and just like money, like the full spectrum. And um, uh, especially want to focus on the underserved population and rural um, rural practice as well. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks. Um, is it, I'm, okay, Rhea? Raya? Rhea? Good. Yeah, <laughs> it's Ria. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a fourth year from LECOM. Um, right now, I'm doing my rotations around Cleveland, Ohio. Um, some of my interests in family medicine are adolescent medicine and addiction medicine. So, All right. We will get to those. I'm, now I'm jotting down notes because more people are bopping in and my memory will start going shortly. So um, let me. OK, I got it. Excellent. Nice to meet you. Which um, Erie campus are you at? I'm at the uh, Erie campus. Erie campus. Okay, great. That's where I graduated from. Oh, so nice. That was when it only existed in Erie. So things have, have changed a lot for that school. All right. Next on my screen, I see, is it Fiona? Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Fiona. I'm a fourth year medical student at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine in New Jersey. Um, I'm from New Jersey. 
and I love the East Coast. Um, I'm interested in um, broad spectrum family medicine, um, in particular uh, areas under complementary medicine, like integrative and functional medicine. Um, I'm currently pursuing like coursework um, and getting my certification um, in functional medicine. Um, so that's something that I'm really passionate about and interested to know how the program is going to support me in that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All right. Next up, I see Brittany. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, I, I'm, I hope it's not too loud. I'm in the library right now. But um, uh, my name is Brittany. I'm a medical student at PCOM Philadelphia campus. And um, I'm also just interested in broad spectrum family medicine. Um, some areas of interest I do have um, are women's health and um, also addiction medicine. Um, okay. So, but uh, just very interested to hear about all the different options with family medicine tonight. Super, great. And are you a third or fourth year, Brittany? I'm a fourth year. Fourth year, okay, great. Um, all right, I see Maria, are you able to chat? Hi there, uh, my name is Maria Nadales. I'm actually, I'm IMD, uh, born and raised in Venezuela. Um, this year I'm applying for the match season and I'm very interested in family medicine because I'm um, very interested in preventive medicine and health equity. So, but I'm very excited to know more about the options in terms of fellowships for family medicine. Mm -hmm. So it will be great to uh, hear more today. Great. I will definitely get to that. All right, mm -hmm. Kayla. Kayla might not be able to chat. That's okay. Kayla, type in the chat if you want, otherwise just listen in. And then I see a phone number that doesn't have a name. 305. Kayla, thanks, I see your chat. Let me get over to it so I can see we're from St. Matthews. You're very welcome. No problem. Tech, tech is always a challenge. Rural and women's health track. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, all right. And then the phone number disappeared. So there you go. I scared off the phone number. I, maybe it's a duplicate. It's cool. Um, okay, great. Well, with that, let me share my screen. We'll get through my uh, stuff. And then we can certainly chat about your specific interests. That's the nice thing about a small group. I am clearly informal. Please, um, you can call me Jackie. You can also call me Dr. Weaver. I never go by the full mouthful. Um, that was just my married tack it on. Um, but I go by Dr. Weaver at work because people can pronounce that much, much better um, than anything else. So let me attempt to find my share screen. Open this. Can you see it? Excellent. All right. I see some head nods. Um, so family medicine, and I never know if you can see the little bobble head or not too, but let me just minimize that, which means I can't see any of you right now. So um, just chime in if you want to ask a question. Otherwise, we can wait till the end there. So um, again, Jackie weaver Agostoni, I'm the program director at UPMC Shadyside here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um, so why this topic? This topic actually came up from some of my residents um, a few years ago who were just sort of felt like they didn't know what all was possible and they were finding out a little too late to know what was even out there. So um, I put this together actually for them and then I provided it some med for some medical students along the way too, because I think it's really fun to think about what you can do with family medicine. And that's one of the real highlights of this profession is it's so, it's got so much variety. Um, so originally I wanted to be a pediatrician. I clearly changed my mind. Um, I decided I was going to do actually better care for the kids if I saw the whole family. I stand by that to this day. There's certainly I've I've you know been able to treat some moms and dads and grandmas and grandfathers, and I love that aspect of family medicine. Um, and so I did change my mind to switch to family medicine. I went to Lecom and Erie. I'm from an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh, so I have never lived anywhere further away from here than Erie. Um, as opposed to some of you who I sure, I'm sure have much more varied life uh, life stories and places you've lived. Um, I'm pretty boring on this side of Pennsylvania. Um, I went to my residency then here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at a place called West Penn, who no longer actually has a family med program um, based on some uh, hospital mergers and things that happened in the past. But that's where I trained, which is right down the street from where I ended up working. 
Um, West Penn was a three-year program. I was chief resident my third year. Then I went to do a fellowship in academics because I wanted to teach. And even though you can graduate straight from residency and go into a teaching position, I figured there must be more to it than that. And certainly there had to be a skill set. So I did a faculty development and research fellowship for two years at St. Margaret's here in Pittsburgh. And as part of that fellowship, I got my master's in public health at the University of Pittsburgh. That was sort of all part of the deal for two years. So I did that. I actually had my daughter during that time as well, who is now a senior in high school, which is totally crazy to me. Um, and so I completed the fellowship and I then got hired at UPMC Shadyside. Um, and as an osteopathic physician, they originally hired me to basically take over their osteopathic um, training program when I had enough years under my belt to basically become the director of the osteopathic part of our program, which I did after about three years of being, two or three years of being at Shadyside. I did that for a while when there used to be separate accreditation arms, AOA and ACGME. And then once the merger happened, um, the program director before me was transitioning into more part-time work and that put me in charge of everything. So I've been the program director here now going on six years, but I've been here for a total of now 16. Um, and that's sort of my backstory and why I chose to do extra training. Um, interestingly, the extra training I did is not accredited. No faculty development fellowships actually have accreditation. So you don't get any initials after your name or anything um, that proves you did anything extra actually. Um, it was really just based on the skill set, which is also part of why I did the master's, because then at least I had, quote unquote, something to show for it besides extra skill set. Um, and I found that valuable anyway. And then interestingly, lifestyle medicine came into being about five or six years ago as an actual adjunct to professional uh, careers you could have. And two of us from my program um, during COVID decided that we would go try to get board certified because they were starting up this residency education piece of lifestyle medicine. And we thought it made really good sense for family medicine. So the two of us, um, Dr. Cohen, who's one of my APDs and myself went for board certification in lifestyle medicine. So I am also board certified in that, um, which just happened, like I said, I think two years ago now I got that certification. So you don't have to do this all in order. <laughs> Things sometimes happen differently than that. Um, but that's the story there. Here is a laundry list of fellowships that are available from family medicine. For my program, which we have 10 residents per year at the moment, um, I've had people go into sports medicine, um, faculty development, uh, geriatrics. One is applying, one of my chief residents this year is applying for palliative medicine. I've had two in the last couple of years go for adolescent medicine. Um, I have had several residents go for women's health slash obstetrics. Um, I had one of my grads, actually one of my chiefs from last year who matched into preventive medicine, um, and addiction medicine and integrative medicine. And I'm looking at this list, um, we have a track in my residency program to offer HIV training. So some of them have sat for that board um, actually at the end of residency. So that's sort of a linked program for us. Um, so they haven't gone on to do extras in that. I also actually had one of my graduates go on to do sleep medicine, um, which is a little bit unusual for family medicine um, because that could be with people that have done pulmonary medicine, internal medicine, it's sort of a wide open area. Um, and she was fortunate enough to, to get to do some work with the sleep group and studies with them as a resident here, which is how she really got to know them. Um, so I'd say that's what my group has done. I've also had people who have graduated and done some of these things without a fellowship. So I've had people go straight into hospitalist work. I've had people who still do lots of global health and international health because we have a um, track for that. Uh, lots of underserved care. Ours is primarily urban underserved, of course, being here in Pittsburgh, but I've had people leave and go more rural. Um, and as a matter of fact, a few of my faculty, um, two of them, one of them right now worked in rural Alaska before they came to us. And one of my others uh, faculty actually worked for Indian Health Services for a while. So there's a, a long tradition of really interesting backgrounds in my faculty as well in terms of underserved care. Um, so that's where that stands. Career options. Um, so there's direct primary care, which is sort of a more, a, a newer, not new, new, 
um, it's been out for a little while where you sort of don't work um, under the constraints of systems per se. Uh, it's a little more independent. Uh, people can still have insurance, but you sort of don't personally work through it. Um, and so I don't do DPC, they call it. Um, so I can't speak to this with any authority except to know somebody who does in my area and know what she has told me about it. Um, but that is sort of an up and coming area that you can certainly do when you're done if that's uh, sort of where your heart lies. You can be employed. You can do either locums, um, which some of my grads have gone on to do where you sort of float between places that they need you to be. Um, often good if you're some people have done this because they were waiting for a trailing spouse to figure out where they were going to end up having to go. So sometimes it's a nice sort of break that you're still working, but you're getting to see lots of different things and help different um, areas out. So that's a possibility. There's, of course, also going into academics, um, whether that be med school academics with a practice on the side, whether that be graduate medical education with residency training, lots of versions of that. There are multi-specialty group practices where you would basically have maybe the cardiologist in the same office as the primary care docs, and then someday maybe psychiatry comes in, um, so you can have a multi-specialty group practice. You can do part-time, you can do private practice. That's a little more challenging in today's day with, um, I think most people that are trying to do private practice actually end up going more the direct primary care route at the moment. Um, just because it's challenging, but if you're really good at business and you like business, um, private practice might be a nice thing to try. Um, and then certainly rural practice, which is sort of um, separate on here, but one could argue it's still underserved. And so it's got a similar vibe. So more specifically, family medicine career path. So you can do full scope family medicine. That means you deliver babies. So full scope to me means actual full scope. Some people say full scope and what they really mean is everything but OB. So interestingly, I still get to do prenatal care because I work at a residency program and I help teach it, but I don't show up anymore to deliver the babies. Two of my faculty do show up to deliver babies and they also do everything else I do. Um, so, you know, there's different sort of versions of full scope um, and the possibility of doing that sometimes depends on your geographic location. So you may be able to, you know, to deliver babies straight from residency, but it often takes a lot more um, dedicated time to OB during your residency. So you have to spend elective time. You have to do not just the baseline required OB rotations, but more. So in my group, um, and what they're sort of recommending nationally is if you plan to deliver uh, low risk, if you plan on doing low risk OB after you graduate, you have to have done 80 vaginal deliveries during residency. Most of my crew get 25 by the time they are done with their rotations. So 80 is way more than 25. So that's why often, um, but the people who love it, love doing it. And so they end up going for more um, electives and doing extra things um, to deliver babies. Uh, there's also limited scope. So you can do just outpatient. You can leave and do, um, you know, you can still include the pediatric patients. You can still include gyne. You don't have to. Nobody mandates what the family docs continue to do in practice. You know, most of us, especially in academics, you get to keep doing anything you want, um, which is sort of the fun of that. But, um, you know, a lot of places you can choose to do these things. The part of the geographic location that matters is if you plan on doing prenatal care, you need to be somewhere that family docs are permitted to do obstetrical care and that there's a system where you will have backup if you're just doing vaginal deliveries and you don't have the extra training to do C-sections, if something should go wrong, you need to have the ability to call people in to help. So that tends to happen more in um, either settings that are extremely underserved and need people to do OB or academic centers. There are some places that it would be very challenging, I think, to do prenatal care. The other interesting thing to think about if you're doing something that is um, full scope like that and you're in a practice, so let's say that you leave and there's an internal medicine group and you're the one family doc in the group and you want to continue to do pediatric care, but nobody else in your group does it. You have to remember somebody has to be on call for those patients. And if the rest of your group is uncomfortable, now you need to partner with other groups that are willing to help share the peds calls that come in. Otherwise, you're going to be on call every single night depending on how your call center works and all that stuff. So just things to keep in mind. I mean, it's sort of higher level thinking maybe for where you are in your training, but this is the reality of how things work in real life. So just sharing that in advance. 
Um, certainly if you're in a group that does everything, then everybody covers everything and it doesn't really matter. You can go straight to be a hospitalist. You can just round in the hospital and you can do that from a family medicine program. So depending on where you train, different programs definitely have different strengths and weaknesses and some are sort of more full scope than others. And um, like I said, my program, it's probably pretty balanced between outpatient and inpatient. We actually require slightly more inpatient than the ACGME does. And I think because of that, there's a comfort level when people leave us that some have just gone to be hospitalists. So they didn't need to do extra training. They simply joined a hospital and that was that. Um, group practice, again, you could be multidisciplinary. It might be hospital owned, maybe it's separate. Um, urgent care, ER, you can definitely do that sort of work. A lot of ERs have different restrictions on whether you need to be board certified in emergency medicine or if family physicians are allowed to do that. Lots of urgent cares have family physicians, though some of them are going to more of an APP model with the with the physician just sort of doing a lot of oversight. Um, but that's still a possibility depending on where you are. School health, certainly. Um, certainly college health centers all have people providing care and a lot of those are family physicians. And so um, primary care can certainly help staff those. Health policy and administrative. You can go work for an insurance company if you wanted. You can be that doctor that I get to call and be like, my patient needs the MRI because of X. Um, that to me sounds atrocious, but you know, some people love that job. And so I think the other nice thing about what we do in family medicine is you have a lot of variety and you know, lots of these things suit lots of different people. And I've had friends who did one type of practice, switched into another and switched and now they're working for an insurance company. So you know, you can also sort of transition some of these things over your career, depending on where you are in your own life. You can also work for the government, you can go work for the CDC, you can go work for, you know, those types of places. Faculty academic medicine, certainly I'm an expert on that one because I've been doing that my whole life in medicine. Um, so pre-doctoral education, part of what I get to do is actually go teach at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, they have a new curriculum. I volunteered with one of my other docs to go over and try that out. So we're helping teach medical interviewing, physical exam skills, sort of the basics of first year students. We also have a tremendous number of med students who rotate with us. So I get to work with lots of osteopathic students. We have an OMT clinic in our office, so they get to rotate through there. So there's learners around me constantly, and I really enjoy that. And then a residency, like I said. So I actually get to do the best of all worlds, in my opinion, because I get to work with students and residents. Um, so it makes life look a little chaotic, but I function well in controlled chaos. So um, I enjoy that. Then there's international medicine, whether you do that full-time or part-time. So like I said, we have a global health track in my program. Those trainees actually get to go to a community in Honduras for two weeks every year of training. So they get to go for a total of six weeks by the time they're done with me. And some of them have left and joined groups that continue to go do medical missions once a year. Some of them built it into their contract that they can take a sabbatical for like a month or six weeks a year and they go somewhere. Some people have connections to their home countries and they go help there. So, you know, some of that sort of built in amongst other things. There's also something called semester at sea where you can actually be the physician on a cruise ship or on a student. The semester at sea is actually um, students from colleges who are out there on a boat doing educational things. Um, one of my uh, community docs who helps precept out of my office actually has done semester at sea twice. He really enjoys it, but it's not like his full-time job. So he does that like as an occasional thing. Um, and then sports medicine, of course, you can uh, uh, you can do sports medicine straight from family medicine, particularly if you plan on staffing like local high school games or something like that. If you ever wanna go to the Olympics, you wanna get hired by the NFL, the NHL, any of those, then you need to have a sports medicine fellowship uh, credential. Um, but you can certainly do sports medicine without the extra training if it's just that you wanna do some in your local community. Okay. Considerations when choosing a residency. So I already alluded to, we have tracks. So lots of residency programs have lots of sort of special curricular areas that you can focus on. Um, we have an underserved track. We have a global health track. We have a HIV track. We have an unofficial sports med track, which is just built on common sense. And I refuse to call it a track because it's just general common sense of like when you should rotate and what you should be doing to try to get a fellowship. So that's unofficial. I also have an unofficial geriatrics track because again, I sort of got on this bandwagon. Why do we keep separating this all out? It's all family medicine. So we just try to be very thoughtful with um, specializing and in individualized learning plans for everybody who comes to my program. I know what all of them plan on doing. And then we try to build a curriculum with the required stuff, plus the cool stuff that goes along with what they want to do. Um, one of the fellowships I actually did not see on my slide, which I should add, 
is medical informatics. So one of my residents decided they wanted to do medical informatics, which is basically looking at how tech can help um, improve patient care and do population health things. So that's a relatively new-ish area of um, fellowship training. And he actually came back and is helping Precept out of my office now. So that is um, also something you can do that I failed to mention before. And that reminded me of what my graduates do. Um, the other thing when considering choosing a residency is look at what their graduates have done. If every single graduate has specialized in something and they 100% go on to do a fellowship, if you go there thinking you're going to stay general and you don't want to do a fellowship, if 100% of them do a fellowship, there's probably a reason why. They're geared towards it. That's their mentality. You're going to end up doing a fellowship. So, you know, I think look at what the graduates do. And if nobody's ever done the thing you're thinking of, um, that's okay. You can be creative. You might be the first, but you have to go somewhere that they've accommodated interesting interests in the past. Um, look at the backgrounds of the faculty. Um, that can be very diverse on its own, but like I said, with my faculty, even though we're urban underserved, several of them worked for years in rural underserved, and so they have a connection there, and they can talk to people about what that was like, so you can have some mentorship um, with just knowing the background of the faculty. Then, dual training programs versus programs with curriculum emphasis. I bring this up because there's certainly family med psych programs, there's family med ER programs, there's family med this program. Um, they're very far and few between, so there are not a lot of them, and they often take more than three years, so you have to keep that in mind in terms of timing. Um, and then some programs may not have that dual thing, but they're really strong in some curriculum areas. So in my program, I think we're very robust in women's health, we're very robust in addiction medicine, and we're very robust in behavioral health. Like, you can't avoid those if you try, kind of strong. So, you know, I think in other programs that you would go to might be really strong in um, procedures and like you might leave there being able to do vasectomies. You can't leave my program being able to do vasectomies without a little bit of extra effort. So I think, um, you know, those are the interesting things to think about in terms of when you're looking at programs or their websites. Um, and then what kind of training is available? So if you do have special interests, you should always find out how that program is going to accommodate you learning those special interests, knowing that it's probably not part of many people's programs. So for instance, of the things you all mentioned, let's take um, uh, like complementary medicine. We have an elective in complementary medicine. The cooler edition recently is one of my faculty actually got this interest later in life and he just got trained in acupuncture. So he's going to be able to, he's been doing you know, interest groups for people to learn some acupuncture. He's now treating patients out of the office with acupuncture. Um, but the tricky thing is that you may not be able to do acupuncture, even if you're trained in your own office hours, because none of the rest of us are credentialed in acupuncture. So we can't supervise you doing it because we don't know what you're doing. So it's, um, you know, just things to consider. So we have lots of interesting ways to integrate things, but it's maybe not what you were thinking it was going to be. So always ask programs what they're capable of doing. And it could just be like an away elective. I just filled out a form today for one of my second year residents who's going to go do this away elective in altitude medicine. I can't do altitude medicine in Pittsburgh. She's going to, you know, Kathmandu to do this elective. Cool. So like I can facilitate that happening. Um, but I can't offer it out of my program. So that was sort of an extra interesting thing. So that's literally the end of my slides. Um, let me stop sharing so I can actually see your faces again. And then, um, oh, we had a few more people join. Hello, a few more people that I didn't meet earlier. Um, Pauletta, do you want to tell us a little bit about, we went around earlier and just said who we were and like our year in school and if you have any special interests within family medicine. Yeah, my name is Pauletta. I'm a fourth year student at Toro in Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in Middletown. Um, I can't turn my camera on right now because you're good in a safe, uh, like in a private environment. Yeah. But I want to make sure I showed up. Um, I'm interested in women's health and okay. also geriatrics. Oh, okay, great. Um, and I think is it Kirtan? Yeah, Kirtan. Kirtan, thank you. Um, I am currently a fourth year medical student at St. George's University. Okay. I'm originally from Canada. Okay. Great. Um, I'm interested in obstetrics, uh, mainly and mm -hmm. gynecological experiences, but I've also had a newfound interest in 
sports medicine. So like sports injuries. Okay. Great. Okay, cool. Okay. So for the few of you that mentioned sports med, um, I will tell you that in the family medicine world, that is one of still the most uh, competitive fellowships. So that is one that when people come to me and they sit down for orientation, I say, does anybody in here want to do sports medicine? Day one, I need to know. Because you need to start building your CV to make you a competitive candidate to do a sports medicine fellowship. So whether you're like dead set on it or if it's like an inkling in the back of your brain, I want to know. Because you have to start on that path because if you wait until second year and you're like, oh, I have fallen in love with sports medicine, I'm going to do it. You're way behind. You're not going to get the longitudinal coverage stuff. You're not, you're not going to get anything to back up your CV. So we jump on that one. I jump on that one because I want people to get what they want when they come to me. Um, right away, because you need to start building your CV. And like I said, in our program, we have longitudinal high school football coverage. And I've had residents actually match at big name colleges um, to be able to staff like their college games and stuff for fellowship. And they were specifically told you got this position because you did longitudinal coverage during residency. So yes, you can do these one-time volunteer experiences with like the, you know, the great race in Pittsburgh. People volunteer for that clearly. We sometimes have the U.S. Open golf tournament come to Pittsburgh. You can volunteer with that. That all looks good, but it was truly the longitudinal experience that I've been told has helped them the most. So regardless of where you go, look and see if there's some sort of longitudinal experience you can do um, to help beef that up. The other thing I do with my unofficial track, which again, I didn't do a sports medicine fellowship. So this was all based on feedback from my grads. My grads go out, they do cool things, and then they tell me all about it so that I can help um, steer people correctly uh, who want to do that again in the future. So I've built my whole thing off of what they've told me. Um, and every year, I think we've had somebody do sports medicine from my program. So that's a big interest here. Um, and they basically said, you also need to go to the National Sports Medicine Conference in your second year and present something if you can, because that's also the huge recruitment fair. So um, that's like the, you can't miss it or you've missed your opportunity to meet all these other people. So um, anyway, that's my words of advice on sports med because it's sort of a unique standout. Um, any other questions related specifically to sports med? Okay, cool. Um, Sleep medicine is another like quirky one. So sleep medicine, I would say, because it's also competitive in terms of like lots of specialties can go into that. Uh, it's good if you, you can establish some sort of relationship with a program while you're a resident. That's the only reason one of my residents got that position when she was done. Um, so I think that that's one that makes sense that you have to show interest. And if that interest can be shown at the program you want to go to, that's ideal. It doesn't always work out, but um, you know that's where I think that pretty much stands. Um, in terms of women's health, so women's health, you can get, I think, sufficient education during your three years of residency to be able to do baseline women's health, right? I didn't do extra training in that. I do tons of past smears, vaginal discharge complaints. I've, you know, infertility work, work up, um, all of those things. Uh, I I can still do prenatal care, which I said I, I do, but I don't still do baby care. So if or I don't deliver babies. I still love seeing the babies after the fact. Um, but if you want to deliver and you want to do more than just vaginal, spontaneous, low risk deliveries, you should definitely consider doing a women's health slash OB fellowship. So sometimes when people say women's health, they really mean the OB piece and sometimes they don't. So be clear with that when you're going to programs because they may interpret it one way and you actually meant something else because women's health, they sort of call them all different things. So some of the fellowships are like FMOB. Some of them are women's health fellowships, but they meant OB. So, um, you know, I think that that's sort of an interesting area. Adolescent medicine, um, I think, is a two-year program at most places. Some places do a three-year program because they do more research. So not all fellowships are created equal either. And adolescent tends to be one of those ones that can be either super clinical or clinical and research. And then that sort of extends it and it's a different mojo. So sports med tends to always be sports med. Like, now, the team you cover could be completely different. So even here in Pittsburgh, if you join a UPMC program, you're going to be with hockey and football and other random places. Um, if you join the Allegheny Health Network, which is the competitor here in town, um, they go to the, the baseball game. So they staff baseball. We staff the other two. 
So again, depending on your area of interest in sports, and I actually had one of my grads who had grown up in Pittsburgh, been in Pittsburgh forever, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, who ended up out West because he wanted to work on ski injuries. Guess what we don't have here in Pittsburgh? We don't have a lot of ski injuries or wilderness medicine. So he actually went out West to train because that's what they had. Um, there's different programs that have an emphasis on dance. There's different programs that have a different, tennis. So like, and the same thing for like, you don't know, you, not all fellowships are the same. So it'll have the same name as adolescent medicine, but it may mean completely different things. So yes, the population is always the focus, but what you do in that fellowship might be totally different. So you need to find out sort of the logistics of how many years is it? Cause not all fellowships have to be the same number of years, interestingly. Um, and also sort of what is their emphasis? All right. In addition to that, the addiction medicine, same sort of deal. You may go to a program. People can leave my program and go do tons of addiction medicine treatment if they want. Like we do Suboxone, we do alcohol use disorder. I treat that. I had no extra training. Good to go. What my residents have done though, because some of them were like toying with, do I, do I do the extra year? Do I not? What do I get out of this? And so if you're in that position, you should talk to people who have done it. Why did you choose to do it? Why might you not do it? Um, you know, some of them wanted just extra experience. They wanted just to be able to focus on that patient population. They wanted to get better with the counseling side of things, which you don't necessarily do as ton with in my office. Um, you know, so they had different aspects they wanted. Some of them also wanted to do like more teaching. And so some of them come with like sort of an overlap and you can teach a little and do addiction medicine. Um, so, you know, again, there, it doesn't mean you have to do a fellowship. In family medicine, you sort of have the opportunity to do any of these things you want, as long as your three year, or if you're in a unique program that does a different number of years, that program trained you to do enough to be able to go into practice to do it. Does that make sense? Um, okay, let me look through what else I wrote down for all of you. Um, broad spectrum, you're going to get that from all family medicine programs and the preventive care aspect as well. The interesting thing with Tara, who went like my senior from last year, who went to do um, preventive medicine, it was more of a twist on, she was going to be able to get her MPH. It was more of a health, public health focus, which we do, we dabble in, you know, of course we do some, you know, population health, we do some training on it, but that's not like the emphasis of what we're doing all the time. And she wanted that. So she chose her program based on, she was going to get her MPH and it's a very public health focused mindset in this program. Um, but everybody from my program can do preventive medicine. It's sort of the degree you want to feel comfortable doing it. Um, and again, like if you want to go work for the World Health Organization, that may matter to them. And they will maybe choose that candidate over somebody who just has three years of residency experience. So again, if you have your eye sort of on the big picture long game of like, where do you really want to end up? Sometimes you need to think about those things in advance. And it is not all on your shoulders to figure this out. My goodness, right? This is just, I'm one person. You're going to have advisors in residency. You're going to have tons of people you can talk to. You're going to find mentors at organizations like FMEC. You know, you're going to go to a talk where somebody's giving and you're like, oh, this is an interesting person. I should talk to them. And then you're going to meet them. And then you can connect over the, you know, internet and keep in touch and ask them questions. So, you know, the great thing about family medicine is that we tend to run in the same groups. So, um, you know, with FMEC, I have tons of friends that I see at that meeting. And then I see at this other meeting. And then these same people are at this other meeting because it's family med and we all teach, we're all educators. So we tend to gravitate to the teaching meetings where you get to see lots of family docs and like program directors, we're all friends in Pennsylvania, right? So I think the other way to get some of this information, even if it's an inkling, is to just go, like if you're coming to FMEC, find the talks that have to do with the topics you're interested in and then get over chat with that person and be like, hey, how'd you decide to do this? What was your training path? Where did you do your fellowship, right? That kind of thing. Um, so anyway, that's my overall spiel on that. Um, I think I touched on a lot of what people had mentioned in the intro. If I missed anything big, please ask it again now. Um, and lifestyle medicine, that's another one. So you can join a program that does lifestyle medicine curriculum during their three years. We are doing that in my program. Several UPMC programs are doing that, but it is really new. It's really new, like it only came into existence like three years ago. So needless to say, there have been some growing pains with the whole curriculum that isn't our fault, 
but we're sort of in the midst of trying to help sort it out with the residents. And I'm like, I'm sorry, now you have to do this. They changed it. Oh, wait, now you have to record this. So it hasn't been smooth sailing. I'm not certainly going to sell it that way. But um, there are programs where our goal was that if you wanted to get board certified in that by the end of your three years, that that's what you could do. So we've integrated some of it into our actual curriculum because again, lifestyle medicine makes 100% sense for people in family medicine to know, right? It's better education on nutrition. It's more focused on physical exercise. It's all the stuff you tend to not get in med school, right? You don't get any nutrition. I think I had one hour talk on nutrition during med school. It was abysmal. I didn't remember anything about it. You know, fat, bad, sugar, bad, whatever. So it's a little more in-depth than that. So I think it's really applicable to people as a mindset. It also talks about sleep hygiene. It talks about substance abuse. It talks about, so there's like these pillars that lifestyle medicine are. We started up diabetic group visits focused on lifestyle medicine to give the residents a venue to be able to practice some of this stuff. So that also counts towards their, you know, ability to sit for that test at the end of three years. But it does take extra work on your own because you can't do all of that with just your like weekends and nights, right? Like you still have work hours to abide by. So we incorporate some of it and we help track what they've gotten done, but they still have to do a little bit of work on their own and or use an elective time to do a lifestyle medicine elective and or, right? So we've got a lot of ways to work around it. Um, but what my program tends to do, and I think lots of good programs out there do this, um, they actually try to adjust the curriculum to what you need. So there's baseline requirements for family medicine that everybody has to do. You have to do some months of OB, you have to do some peds, you have to do some women's health, you have to do outpatient you know, um, continuity care, you have to do some surgery, you have to do, there's required rotations. Once those requirements are done, the rest of it's a lot of wiggle room. So the fun I have is when people come to me and are like, like Kevin several years ago was like, I wanna do medical informatics. And I said to Kevin, that sounds really awesome. I don't know what it is, tell me, what do we need to do for that? Didn't know what we were talking about, right? So he taught me, I looked it up, I found somebody, I, we called up the UPMC IT person and I was like, hey, I have this resident interested in medical informatics, any way they can come hang out with you for a little bit? And they were like, sure. So we got this brand new rotation set up with like the top IT person at UPMC and all, you know, history was written then, right? So Kevin went off, did his two years and came back. Um, and now he's part of that team. So I think, um, you know, there's really... That's the luxury to me of being in a very resource heavy, big system. There's downsides to giant health systems as well, right? You can't turn the corner in our hospital and not run into another trainee of some discipline. That's just how it is. Um, but the, it's so big that it kind of doesn't matter. Like we can accommodate all that because there's so many patients that nobody needs to step on toes. There's plenty of patients that need seen. So, but it's a different field than if you're somewhere more rural and you're like the only trainees, like you're the only person in the OR. Oh my gosh, if my residents showed up and were the only person in the OR, they'd be like, what's happened? Why am I here alone? Um, so, you know, I think it's a different vibe. Um, but, you know, like I said, I take advantage of that where I can, because then I can create cool, interesting things for people that have interesting ideas. So anyway, we have about 16 minutes left. I will pause. I'm happy to take any other questions or anything else you want to hear about. Hi. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh especially in the beginning explaining about the sports medicine stuff it's good to keep in mind while we get into residency and sorry i'm at work right now so if you hear phones going off whatever you're else good. Like, all right so one of the things i really like about family medicine is that you're able to do like kind of you're able to tailor it into what you want it to be so right now i'm working at an urgent care but i have a panel of patients that i follow where i do primary care stuff too and i'm able to see them for not just acute but chronic illnesses as well yep in the future um after graduating from residency and fellowship is it possible to do like let's say two or three days in primary primary care clinic then two or three days in sports medicine and then yep. perhaps like moonlighting yeah. at a yeah, urgent care or er mm -hmm. so i have there's i know people who have done all versions of this so my my quickish answer is you can do all versions but it depends on what kind of sports med you want to do so for instance one of actually several of my grads do exactly what you said they staff a local sort of not high ranking college team stuff. They do some college stuff and then they have a primary care practice that they do several days a week and they help with some other random stuff. Okay, so that's totally possible. I don't know of anybody really who works with like NFL, NHL, like you're at their beck and call and you're not having a private practice in addition to that. That's your that's your job You're that you're committed to that. I think it's really hard to 
do anything different than be at their beck and call because those are really high level professionals and they may need you at any second, right? So they have a little bit, like they might work at like a sports med center, but like they, 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 they're sports med all the way. I, I don't know of anybody that does like a general family med plus um, that kind of sports med, that level. Um, I, as a family doc, volunteered at the U.S. Open though. I don't have a sports med fellowship. I just, I have my BLS and I showed up and was like, hey, can I help? And they were like, sure. So like, if I wanted to help at the, at the race, the great race, I could do that as a family doc. So like, you can do that sort of stuff. Definitely you can do like high school stuff. Um, one of my other grads who did sports med actually joined an orthopedic practice. So they do all the surgery stuff and he does all the sports med stuff and he loves it like that. Um, I have another grad who does general, uh, general family medicine who staffs at the college here locally, comes and teaches at my residency, goes to the CMU Student Health Center to teach over there and do care for their patients. It's like, he's got a very uh, jigsaw puzzle career and he loves it. He loves running around doing all the different stuff, but it's not a high level college team. And it's like not a high level, you know? So it, it's, I think once you get on those really high level um, sports professional teams, I don't think you can do general family med with that. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's honestly the the one that I'm more interested in this general, not like high level sports, but rather sure. taking oh, care then of Oh, like... then 100% you can do it. Yeah. You yeah. can do injections during your in office hours. You can do an integrated five day a week thing. You can do a separate like Monday sports med, Tuesday general, Wednesday sports med. Like you can set it up however you want. Yep. Great. Okay. That's excellent. I know. Totally I think possible. yeah, it's the right, it's the right field. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Any other questions out there? I yeah, I have oh, several. Okay, ahead. Fiona, I think I heard you first, and then we'll go to Neil. Sorry, Neil. Um, uh, my question is more about uh, your program in general. Sure. If you don't mind. Um, so you mentioned your strengths were women's health, addiction medicine, and behavioral health. So I was wondering what you, as a program, were trying to improve, and sure. you know what? Yeah, basically what. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We are always trying to improve. If I said, if I'm ever at a stagnant program, I'm going to quit. I love to like, you know, do new things. So the lifestyle medicine was relatively new. How robust our addiction medicine has gotten is new. So we now have a dedicated social care, uh, social worker for the addiction medicine patients who will literally walk across the street because we're right on the same campus, which is really cool. She'll walk across the street to meet a patient in the hospital who is there for alcohol withdrawal to try to link them with, with our program. Like, She's amazing. So anyway, that's been a huge new addition um, to addiction medicine. I would say our point of care ultrasound training is present, but not exactly robust. So like we were doing like some OB, we were doing like this and that. Um, the reason it wasn't totally robust is none of my faculty had training in it. That's relatively new. I know all of you now in school are doing all sorts of curriculum and you got your little handheld stuff. None of us had any of that. So you can imagine being in... Um, a full-time position trying to learn all this new stuff, right? So I actually built into some of the faculty time um, their ability to go get trained. So I have some of them getting certified for different areas of focus. And we have to get it set up so that the images we do go into the system and can actually be like part of the chart if we're gonna do it for real. Otherwise we're just doing it for education. And so we're trying to work through the logistics of which they are innumerable. It's been a very interesting process. Um, I think our goal with that is actually gonna be though that all grads can do a AAA screen by the time they graduate. Again, it's a super low bar. It's it's like bare minimum, please let's be able to do a AAA screen. Like, but I was trying to pick something practical that's like family med and not like joint injections. Everybody's got these stupid things for joint injections and like, yeah, yeah, you can scan and poke needles in. But like, I wanted something like tangibly other than that. Um, so again, it's on OB, you get to use it in the ICU in our hospital, it's in the ER, um, you know, so there's different places to use it. There's a way more functionality though, than what I'm going to end up with for now. Right. So you could use it for like leg swelling. Is it a clot? I don't know. Let's try to discern that. Right. Like that would be a different level than like, oh yeah, that's an ultrasound machine. Where's the jelly? You know? So I think it's, it's not there. So that's one area for sure. I've been trying to like beef up, but it's taken time and money and people's energy to like, go do it. Um, I think Dr. Tackadai's acupuncture thing is super cool, but we're still trying to like feel out like, where does, where does this belong? Does it belong? Is it just going to be like an elective thingy? Um, like I said, we put together like these interest groups. So when POCUS came to be an interest 
Uh, about six years ago, I would say from some of my residents who, funny enough, wanted to use sports med and they were like, we need focus. And I was like, again, I don't know what that stands for, but let's figure it out. So we figured it out. We got this interest group going. They were perpetuating it, right? Like they were throwing the meetings. We got the equipment. Like I was like, what do you need? Let me figure out how to get that. So, you know, we've done all that. But um, I now have a resident who's actually taking a POCUS elective from an outside place that she qualified because she's an under she's an underrepresented minority. And there was a special program the school was doing she found out about. And so like you get this like actual butterfly thing. And I was like, this sounds great. But that's like one of 30 residents is going to get that. So anyway, we're still feeling that out. Um, OB for people who actually want to do OB straight from residency. I think that's still a challenge. It takes a lot of elective time. It's a lot of like just trying to like it's you've got to be very self-motivated to get that. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to fix that anytime soon. People have been able to do it from my program, but like I said, it was like their passion. And I was like, I'm on board with you. Let's figure this out. But it doesn't like land in your lap. So that's probably an area that I would say you might be better served somewhere that does a ton of OB like out in the West or in a rural program where like they're, they're it. Um, so I would say right now it's the focus that I'm really trying to like get integrated. Um, a patient advisory council, we're starting to build one of those. That's a new requirement in the new uh, family medicine rules. And it's something we always wanted to do was to get some patient input into like, how are we doing things? What do you think we should work on? I think it's a really cool idea, but trying to functionalize that in our system has been challenging. So we are still building that. So there's like little pieces of that we're still working on. Other curriculum, I mean, honestly, I think we're pretty robust. I would always love to get more kids outpatient. I find when you're in an urban setting, doing family medicine, there is a pediatrician within like 10 steps in five directions from my office, not to mention all the other family docs and internal med docs, right? So the competition for like kids is intense in an urban setting. So even though I think my residents, they all do all their training at children's hospitals. So they got tons of inpatient peds, tons of ER peds, like they do lots of peds training, but it's not their patients. And that really irritates me. So I would love to drum up more business there. Interestingly, the way to get more kids in a practice and residency is to do more deliveries. So I'm forever trying to like drop up pregnant women. And then we're trying to at the same time train LARC, right? So everybody can do long acting reversible contraception, IUD placements and Nexplanon by the time they leave me. But I'm laughing because I'm always like, okay, we need more LARC. Wait, wait, we need pregnant women. It, like it all like works against each other. So we just need more of everything. But um, I haven't quite problem solved the how to get more kids in the practice. That's always a dream of mine. I, I like seeing kids. So I think it's just fun. So like I said, I think the grads leave. They get their bare minimum, but it's a bare minimum. And it's sort of like, I would love to do more of that. So anyway, Neola, what's your question? Yeah, so I wanted to know what are the opportunities for teaching, uh, you know, if, if you're not working, say, in a, in a university-based uh, per yeah, practice. so you can always get medical students in your office. There is such an exponential growth of osteopathic medical schools in the community. We have Duquesne University here in Pittsburgh that's going to be opening a DO school. We have all the new branches of PCOM. LECOM just added one up in New York. Um, there's a new school that's going to be in, uh, I think, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. There's going to be a new school at IUP, maybe, which is like an hour and a half from here. There are so many schools and students that need places to rotate that you could 100% get students in your office. I have lots of grads who do like community-based family medicine who just have students. They host students. They teach students in their office. That's fine you can always look into like what's around. So if you happen to be nearby a med school, they're always looking for help in some arena. Now, granted, some of it's voluntary. You're not going to get paid most of the time to take those students. Um, so, you know, it depends on if it's an income stream or if you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart and you love to teach. Um, there's also online mechanisms now, right? There's, there's these sorts of things. You can always like get partnered up with other organizations that do online education. And, um, you know, there's ways to reach out that way. You could, if there is a school somewhere within commutable distance or driving distance, or even if you had to go stay overnight, you can go like talk to a family medicine interest group at a school and provide education that way. They like um, outside speakers. You can always like, you know, again, it depends on what, what you want to teach, how you want to teach it. Um, you know, if you're in a hospital, we still have community doctors who round in our hospital who work with my residents. We have two different inpatient teams. One is our family health center team and the other one is a community team. Because I think it's really cool to get to role model how you can continue to do outpatient medicine when you graduate. So they do, they're like old school family docs. They still do outpatient. They do inpatient and round on their patients. 
they take turns. It's really cool. And because I think my grads have seen that, I've graduated people who went out and joined those groups because they wanted to keep doing everything. They wanted to do inpatient, they wanted to do outpatient. And you can, you can totally do that, but you have to join the right practice and you have to be in the right system that accommodates that. Um, but so I think there's, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you want to teach, there's a thousand ways to come up with like what it's, you know, totally um, with the advent of social media, you can put stuff up there now and teach patient education and like create your own channel. And I mean, that's totally out of my realm, but I know it exists. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, there's lots of ways to do it. Some more formal than others, but. Yeah, those are great suggestions. I just wanted to ask, uh, like you told me, you told us that you had done a, a special fellowship just for teaching, right? Yep. So do you have something integrated into the curriculum for your residency program? Yeah, we just did a talk today actually on professionalism and how to give appropriate feedback. So uh, we did a whole feedback talk today. So, and we do a session on how to, how to work with med students because you know, you can imagine you're a resident. We don't put outpatient students in general with my first year residents because they're just trying to figure out what's going on in the first place. So they don't need the extra stress of having a learner with them. Um, but as a second year, you can like show up and there's a med student with you and you're like, what am I supposed to do with you? So like, you know, I think that we do some education on like how to, how to teach when you don't know what's going on yourself, how to, there's still something teachable, right? You have excellent skill set. You just need to figure out what you can share and then look the other stuff up together, right? There's, there's techniques to do this. Um, that benefits everybody. So I think um, we do some of that education. Uh, a couple of my residents wanted to do academics. And so I actually got them set up to teach at the University of Pittsburgh. They do, um, like I said, that intro to medical interviewing. They like they do some different classes over there. They've redone the curriculum. So it's not quite as user-friendly now, but I'm part of it. So I'll be able to fill out what's possible in the future. And I actually have them come over there. I help do the women's health um, intro for the family med clerkship. I've had residents actually come teach that for me. So I've sent residents over during residency and been like, hey, you want to teach? This will be good. Go do it. So, you know, and I've given them feedback, like I'll go watch them do it. And then I just sit there and watch them do it. And then I give them feedback afterward on their teaching. So, you know, there's different ways to integrate some of that during residency, but it does take somewhat creative thinking and it takes a program director willing to let you do sort of off the beaten path cool stuff. So um, some are more willing than others. It actually takes a lot of time and energy to do that because it's really easy to just sort of rubber stamp everything. But if you're trying to create new stuff, it takes a lot of paperwork. It's really kind of ridiculous, but it's cool. <laughs> Thanks, sounds great, yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? Hi. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm like, um, I have a background in women's health, uh, yes. ob, ob residency. residency. Uh, but I have a, a older year of graduation, but uh, with lots of experience in US. Mm -hmm. clinical experience so is do you have a fixed cutoff on a year of graduation or yeah so for our program specifically online if you look at the faqs i think it says two years what it doesn't say is that if somebody's been doing some sort of clinical medicine that is family medicine pertinent the reason that year of graduation exists to be honest is because it's a concern that the gap's going to be so big that throwing you into a program that's like super intense and does everything is going to be overwhelming in an already stressful situation. So the goal is to, you know, obviously match and recruit people who are going to be successful. Um, and, but that being said, if somebody has been doing some sort of, um, you know, family medicine, something, uh, or has kept up doing all the women's health and is still like, you know, doing some stuff for men or, you know, like it's important, I think in an application then to share, what other things that you've been doing that are family medicine clinically relevant if your year is older than that? So our program doesn't, we could filter for that and lots of programs do. We try not to, we try to do more holistic review for like everybody. And you know, that's sometimes more possible than others depending on how many applications there actually are um, in the year to have to get through. But the the answer on the online, the uh, that real answer is two years, but we have interviewed people that have had longer gaps than that because they were doing other really clinically relevant things that pertain to family medicine. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, that brings us to seven. So I'm happy to hang out here longer if anybody has any extra questions. Otherwise I will bid you all adieu. And it was very nice meeting all of you. I hope this was helpful. Please feel free to provide feedback on the topic and or my talk to um, Scott or anybody at FMEC because I'm always happy to get feedback. So thank you very much.